I made one mistake with my first M1 MacBook Air. After one year of experience, I'm 100% sure that you should not do it. But before we move to this, I have to admit how awesome this machine is. It literally changed the way I work. Today, with the Mac Studio available, it's much harder to pick the best Mac for your needs. Is the 20-core CPU option and 64 GPU option way overkill? Or maybe you should go with M1 Pro, 16-inch or 14-inch. Or just the basic M1 Air will be enough for the tasks you do every day. A lot of questions to be answered, but still, the M1 MacBook Air looks like a great solution for many users. And I thought that by sharing with you my one-year experience with this laptop will help you with this buying decision, because this small machine is still capable of doing so many things in 2022. I'm excited, hope you're excited too, and let's get into the video. Hey, what's up? My name is Arthur Weiner, and in this video, we've discussed the rumors about the M2 MacBook Air and whether you should wait or get the M1 Air today. Go ahead and watch this video if you need details, but long story short, I would recommend getting the M1 Air today. It's not really worth waiting for the M2, in my opinion, but why is it so good? To begin with, M1 MacBook Air is my very first Mac. I was a Windows user previously, and my latest Windows computer was the Asus ZenBook Pro Duo. Fully specced out, it got the second display touchscreen, and by the way, the main display is also touchscreen, OLED, 4K, all this stuff, but the thing I didn't like about this laptop is that it was very hard to use it as a laptop. I mean, technically it's a laptop, but once you launch, Premiere Pro, After Effects, it's like, you know, a couple of hours of work and you find yourself sitting somewhere in a coffee shop attached to a socket. Not to mention that it's impossible to perform graphics heavy tasks on this laptop when it's not connected to power. So for me, it was more like a stationary machine, although a very powerful machine, rather than a laptop that I can easily travel with. But then the M1 MacBooks came out, light, thin, powerful, you can work all day long on a single charge, and I thought, will the M1 Air cover all my needs? And that's where the interesting things started to happen. At first, I was very skeptical about this laptop, because it didn't look like a powerful machine, and all you can do with it is type, browse the web, edit photos, you know, the very basics. But the reality was, very different. I got the base model, 8-core CPU, 7-core GPU, 8 gigs of unified memory, and 256 gigabyte of storage. I decided not to spend more money on my very first Mac, simply because I was not sure, and I was surprised that even with the base model, I was able to complete most of my tasks on the go. And I think it's crucial for any laptop to be able to work with no problems and thoughts about the battery life. Even if you travel around your house, it's also important because I personally find it exhausting sitting on one place all day long. Sometimes I want to move my body on a couch or on a toilet, but I didn't tell you that. So portability matters, and even though I have the 16-inch MacBook Pro, sometimes I find myself using the M1 Air more just because it's easier to carry and I can get done like 80% of my tasks on it. As a previous Windows user, the battery life and being able to work on a battery power highly appreciated. On the ZenBook Duo, by unplugging the cable, I was losing the performance significantly. On the MacBook, you can forget about this issue. Just put it on charge once or twice a day. And keep in mind that with the basic tasks like web browsing, listening to music, Zoom calls, you might lose less than 50% throughout the day. This is mind-blowing. Sometimes you might even charge it once every two days. And yes, the included 30-watt charger is pretty compact as well. You may have heard that the battery on the 13-inch MacBook Pro is much better, but my experience shows that the difference is not that significant. It's not worth getting the 13-inch MacBook Pro just because it kind of has a bigger battery and active cooling. MacBook Air lacks a fan, and get it as an upside, because on the Pro model, 99 
99% of the time there is no need for them to cool the system. Yes, you will get slightly faster renders, but even with 8K RAW, M1 Air is just 2.5 minutes slower on the 30 minute distance. Do I regret getting the 16 inch MacBook Pro? No, not at all. When I need to get done some heavy video projects or 3D scenes, I move to my M1 Pro because it has more graphics cores and impressive XDR display to complete my color grading perfectly. But for the rest, I use my M1 MacBook Air and I'm so happy with it. We actually get the best from both worlds. On the one hand, it's light, portable. On the other, good enough even for professional tasks. It has a retina display with a resolution of 2560 by 1600. It's 16 by 10 and 400 nits of maximum brightness. And the question you may have is, is it bright enough? And do I need to upgrade to the 14 or 16 inch model to get a brighter display? And I would say, no, you don't. It's slightly dimmer, but not to the point where you cannot see the screen. This new display goes down to 500 nits with a regular use. It can go up to 1000 nits, but only when editing or viewing HDR content. Plus the new mini LED display causes the appearance of this blooming issue. On the air, you just don't have that. And it still has true tone as well as white P3 color. It is really a nice display. The screen may seem a little too small and inconvenient to use programs with complicated user interfaces like Premiere Pro, but if you're gonna use it for tasks like creating a TikTok video or a 10-minute YouTube video, a review like this, or creating a thumbnail in Photoshop, then it's not that big of a deal having the 13-inch display. It's enough. Especially if you're gonna use apps that are fully optimized for macOS, for instance Final Cut or DaVinci Resolve instead of Premiere Pro, then there is no reason to get worried about the screen size. More than that, you can connect one external monitor up to 6K at 60Hz to the M1 MacBook Air, which I think is enough. Having the second display right on top of the MacBook, I really haven't seen a single person faced with this problem. Oh, I need MacBook Air and three extra displays that I'm gonna use every day. If you need two to three extra displays, you're probably a professional and you're probably gonna need a separate computer for this. But for MacBook Air, one extra display is enough. The current M1 Air lacks 120Hz refresh rate, the ProMotion. Do I need it? No. Would I enjoy it? Definitely yes. It's surely pleasing to the eye, these smooth animations, playing games, but it's not something that I strive for and I definitely don't need it for my work. Having two MacBooks side by side, of course I would prefer the MacBook Pro's display over the MacBook Air, but it's not a dramatic difference. It's not like, oh my god, it's so terrible, I can't use it anymore. It's really good and well-balanced display. The webcam on this laptop is like a webcam to expect on a laptop. If zoom calls is all you need, then it's good enough. Yes, it's 720, the 14 and 16 inch MacBook Pros has 1080 camera, but always add to this the speed of your internet connection, which compresses the image, so I don't think it's that big of a deal. The sound quality is more important in my opinion, and it's really nice on this laptop. Of course, the new MacBook Pros have new speakers, which are basically the best speakers on a laptop today, in my opinion, but still, the speakers on the MacBook Air sound great, however, they lack bass compared to the MacBook Pro. Keyboard typing experience is one of the best I've had on a laptop. There are two reasons for this. One is the bottom part of the MacBook having this angling down shape. The edges are not digging into my hands as it usually happens with the MacBook Pro, and two, it's just comfortable and easy to get used to. You cannot adjust the brightness of the keyboard on the keyboard itself, so you will have to move to the control center and manually adjust the brightness. But I prefer keeping the brightness on auto. It works just fine. One thing that I wish this MacBook had is more ports. Here we have just two Thunderbolt 3 ports on the left side, so I always ended up with using a dongle that has a USB Type-A, Type-C, and a card slot. However, considering that this device is not made for pros, two ports for most users should be enough. 
most of the time. In terms of performance, these Thunderbolt ports were pretty consistent. I've plugged in different hard drives, SSDs, dongles, everything worked just fine. Cannot say the same thing about the ZenBook. I had some weird issues with the speed here no issues. If you're still in doubt and the 14-inch M1 Pro seems appealing to you, let's run some tests and see the real difference, because the difference in price is noticeable. $1,000 more for the 14-inch M1 Pro. ProRes exports like four times faster, Blender like 90% better, the only thing that is almost the same is the H.264 export, but either way, I don't think it's critical waiting one minute more to export 50 photos from Lightroom. So the truth is that all the extra features of the MacBook Pros don't really matter that much for a common person or student. One more thing is the resale value. So if you don't plan on using the MacBook for three or five years, then you should consider reselling it for a better deal. And usually, people are looking for the cheapest option they can find. And that brings me to the next point, get the base model, at least for the resale value, but on top of that, there is not that big of a difference when upgrading just the CPU and the unified memory. Some people noted that with 16 gigs of unified memory, you will get a better performance, less bugs and lags, but in my experience, I didn't notice anything critical that would disappoint me, so there is no regret in getting the 8 gigabyte option. But the real mistake I've made is the storage. 256 gigabyte option is a joke, it's nothing, and you will end up cleaning your Mac every other week or so. Paying 200 bucks more for 512GB SSD is so much worth it. Of course, you can get an external SSD, but I am not a fan of it. I prefer using the internal SSD that is perfectly built and integrated by Apple. And by the way, you cannot upgrade your SSD and your RAM so just keep that in mind. Now, can I recommend it for 2022? 120% I do. And I honestly think that Apple made a mistake at some point because M1 Air is just too powerful for this price. Again, I don't see a reason not getting this laptop today, waiting for the M2. I don't think they will make it way more powerful. We'll probably see a slight difference there, but not a significant one. In conclusion, the M1 MacBook Air I recommend is the base model, but with 512 gigabyte of storage. Just get it and you won't regret it. I'm pretty sure this machine will last me next three to five years easily. If you have any questions left, drop them down in the comments. I'll do my best to help you out with your problem. Also smash the like button if you like the video. Check out one of the videos you see on the screen and see you in the next one.